As always, we start in a roundabout way, and today we are going to start by talking about the Dow Jones Industrial Average. For those of you watching your 401ks, your retirement accounts, your investment accounts, the Dow is actually down right now about 760 points as we broadcast live. Um, and that's actually um, recovered a little bit. It was down over 800 points not too long ago. Now, when we get to the end of the day, when we listen to the investment prognosticators tell us why the Dow is down, one of the things that they tell us or that they're likely to tell us is that investors hate uncertainty. We hear that all the time. People in the market don't like to know not to know what's going to happen. They don't like being uncertain and that creates volatility. Well, guess what? In as much as investors hate uncertainty, we spend a lot of time with educators and I can tell you unequivocally that educators also hate uncertainty. We like to plan for our future. We like to know what's coming at us. And in this day and age, that's becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, this from the Washington Post says that state policymakers are facing unpredictability of revenue streams. Why? Well, we all know why. Nobody working in government today has ever dealt with the financial impact of a global pandemic. And state and local stay in, stay in place orders have resulted in some cases of an almost total shutdown of our economy earlier this year. And even as those orders were lifted in the spring of this year, the late spring, states saw a burst of economic activity. Uh, for example, again, according to this article, Massachusetts and Texas actually experienced increases in their sales tax, tax revenue this summer, as the article suggests that that is actu actually totally unheard of in an economic downturn. Uh, however, as some of the states opened up, we all know that a surge of COVID cases forced some of them to turn, turn back around and, and close back down. And that forced additional rounds of economic shutdowns, creating uncertainty. And we all know that educators do not like uncertainty. So this also at a time where our CARES Act funding for education has been exhausted in many cases. And states have, for the most part, made their one-time moves in terms of their budgets. And that work has been completed. Uh, but at the same time, states, districts, and schools face increased costs because of COVID-19 while they are facing declining revenue. The Learning Policy Institute, again, per the Washington Post, estimated that the pandemic's financial costs are between $199 and $246 billion, including the increased costs of dealing with the current situation and the loss of state revenue. This is a size of a financial impact that has been unheard of in the past. Now, here's the interesting thing, especially for uh, those of us working in career and technical education. Even in light of and in the middle of this COVID crisis, manufacturing jobs are still wide open. According to NAM, in August of this year, open manufacturing jobs reached $460 thousand dollars or 460,000 positions rather in August of this year. That was up from July. So we still have, in spite of the pandemic we're in, tremendous numbers of job openings in the world of manufacturing. We're starting to see tremendous numbers of job openings in the world of supply chain. And so we're in a situation literally where demand for our students, either going direct to workforce, going to our community and technical colleges, going on to uh, STEM programs in our universities, demand for that workforce is going up while funding may likely go down, especially at the state and local level. Capital budgets, as we've talked about, I traveled the state of Michigan last week. I heard numbers of stories about capital budgets being at least paused, if not cut back in the wake of all of this uncertainty. So what are we as technical educators to do in this period of time where demand for our students is going up? Our likely funding may be going down. And the answer to that question is that grant funding will become more and more important in the coming years. I say in the next 24 months for sure. And our ability to effectively choose the grants that apply to our programs and to apply for those grants and to win those grants will be the difference maker in the CTE programs that advance during this time of uncertainty and those that stand still or worse yet, go in the wrong direction. Our team has put together a database of grants, of state DOA grants, of Department of Defense grants and Department of Labor grants, Perkins funding, National Science Foundation, family foundations, corporate foundations, and trade associations and others. All of these are great sources of grant funding. If we can identify the grant and if we can effectively approach whoever that grant funding source is with an application that gets their interest and enables us to be successful. 
So joining us today to talk about grant funding are two perfect subject matter experts on this topic. The first is my friend, Jacob Gitter. Jacob is the manufacturing instructor at West Bend East High School. Uh, Jacob has been teaching at West Bend East for 10 years, and he primarily teaches manufacturing and engineering courses. Uh, he also notes that he is a proud husband and the father of two. So Jacob, it is so awesome to have you with us today. And also joining us is another great friend of mine, Kelly Kwiatkowski. Uh, Kelly serves as the Director of Secondary Teaching and Learning for the School District of New Berlin. She was part of the team that built the academic and career planning process for K-12 students in her district, and she works closely with the school's, school district's academic and career pathways and partners. She graduated with a master's degree from my alma mater, Marquette University, with a focus on educational leadership and policy, and received a bachelor's of science degree from the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, along with a math degree. And Kelly is the proud mother of three girls. So we are going to start with a great question. And first of all, I love the fact that the two of you referenced your families as you, um, as you uh, submitted your biographies to us. So we certainly appreciate that. I want to begin with, with a question uh, for both of you. We'll start with Kelly. Um, and, and for both of you, you both come from different roles in different districts, and you've both found great success in your abilities to win grant funds. So Kelly, starting with you, tell us a little bit more about you and also what you've been able to accomplish through these funds. Sure. I just want to start. I don't think we'd be able to accomplish anything without a great team here in New Berlin um, and in our region. So I think grant writing begins with solidifying your team. It takes a lot of work to write a grant, manage a grant, organize it, spend money, um, collect data metrics, as well as uh, finalize out that grant. So we have been able to implement a CNA lab through our health science pathways here on site, uh, create a techno, which is a student run information help desk program, as well as create a brand new manufacturing pathway in the last few years. Uh, also with grants, we were able to add on to our fab lab, um, some awesome equipment and through the tech equipment grant through DWD, we were able to um, add on some intro to manufacturing equipment that really ramped up our students' knowledge in the area of artificial intelligence, automation, and robotics. Fantastic. And it sounds like great things happening at the School District of New Berlin. And of course, I've seen those firsthand. I've seen some great things at uh, West Bend School District as well. And Jacob Gitter, as we welcome you to the program this afternoon, tell us about you. Tell us about your program and how you've been able to accomplish some great, great things using grant funding. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I fell into teaching manufacturing about six or seven years ago. And uh, as a nor normal tech ed teacher, I kind of taught a little bit of everything right away. But now that's pretty much all that I do. Um, and I inherited a lab that was in a pretty bad state. So it's been a long progress uh, process, making a lot of progress, trying to change things, make things safer, uh, update equipment, make it newer, uh, newer processes. Uh, we have a pretty robust program. I have six actual manufacturing courses from uh, welding to general manufacturing. Uh, we have an automation course, which is focuses on robotics and CNC programming. Uh, I have a capstone production level uh, course as well, uh, where we make items uh, to sell uh, to the community. So a pretty robust program, I, I, I like to say. Uh, we've used uh, grants uh, for predominantly for us for updating and changing equipment. That's what we've done mostly in my, my area. Um, making the, like I mentioned before, making the, uh, finding equipment that's safer uh, or just more modern um, and trying to get things in kids' hands that are more relevant to the skills that they're going to need when they leave uh, for, for today's workforce. So your students and your manufacturing employers are both the beneficiaries of all your hard works in terms of securing funding for your your program and producing some amazing students. Turning Absolutely. Turning our discussion now a little bit uh, more specifically to the grants that are available. As our team learned this summer, Kelly, uh, as they put together their da database, this is an incredible number uh, of grants that are out there from national to statewide grants, regional and local grants, and nonprofits, family foundations, and so on. And we know that districts are limited in terms of the resources that they can expend 
pursuing a grant opportunity. So choosing which grants to spend time applying for becomes really, really important. So share with us your process for knowing what to apply for and maybe some best practices on finding grants. Absolutely. So I think a best practice is just um, including yourself in any listservs, conversations in the region, talking to business partners, uh, that helps you find grants. Uh, we always look at grants through a lens, does it align with our strategic plan and where we're going? So if we know where we want to go in the end, we evaluate that grant through those lens. For example, if we have a need to develop out our manufacturing pathway like we did, we're going to look for grants that specifically cater to that area or pathway. I think what's also important is knowing how much you have to spend for a match and how much your board of education or your superintendent or your director or principal will allow you to spend. So you don't wanna spend a lot of time, hours and hours or days on days applying for a grant where you don't have that funding. So knowing that on the front end, I think helps you identify grants that'll work for you and your district. Absolutely, and some, some great uh, best practices there, Kelly. And, and so we're kind of staying on that same topic as we turn first to, to Jacob, um, both both best practices and, and Kelly certainly shared some great ideas with us, um, but also common mistakes. Sometimes Jacob, we can learn as much from what doesn't work as, as what does. And so if you can share any pitfalls that our audience should avoid, that would be helpful. But but if you would just comment a bit on uh, best practices and common mistakes in grant sure. applications and grant funding. I, I apply this in, in most aspects of life or all. Uh, number, number one is be honest uh, in the process. And uh, that goes a long way and doesn't need a lot of explanation, I don't think. Uh, I, I've, I've been very concise when I do mine. Uh, I try not to fill, it, fill them full of fluff that doesn't need to be there. Uh, and I'm realist, I've been realistic with them. Uh, is it something that I can achieve? Is it something we can achieve? Kelly mentioned funding. Um, do you have the funding you know, to start with? Um, and then uh, this is, fashion for me as an instructor, always include the people that are going to be using uh, the equipment. So if you're writing the grant and you're not even going to be using, if it's for a piece of equipment or if it's uh, for a new program or something, if those people aren't a part of it, if those teachers are not a part of it, I think that's a, a, a common pitfall and also a very damaging pitfall. That equipment's going to come in and I've seen this happen locally in my region. It's going to come into the facility. It's going to sit there. Um, that's going to possibly have a, an industry partner's name on it, and it's just sitting there, and nobody's using it, and that's very, uh, very damaging to a program. Um, and then one last thing I'll add that we've ran into before is forgetting about the little extra things that need to be on the grant. Uh, any expenditures, like uh, for large piece of equipment, you have to pay for an erector to bring the piece of equipment in. You have to have it wired. Um, there's training that's involved in using it, right? So it's more than just getting that piece. Now that you have it, what what's it take to get it working? And I saw Kelly nodding her head in agreement with a number of things that uh, that Jacob just just commented on. And Kelly, same question for you. You touched on some best best practices. Any others you would add? And then certainly any common mistakes that that folks should avoid. Uh, I would agree in including your staff right away in the process, um, asking what they need to keep their program growing is really important. Um, and also asking students, what are they interested in learning? Where are they interested in going? I think that student perspective is really helpful when, when writing the grant. Um, so you can talk about their post-secondary aspirations and how it's helping the school district meet the student needs as well as the staff needs. Perfect. And you know, moving on to our next, our next question, uh, it is amazing how often we travel around you know, the, the Midwest and, and you'll see uh, equipment that was maybe purchased using grant funding a year or two or three ago and, and it's sitting there. In fact, I've seen it used as bookshelves, as dust collectors and so on. Um, and and uh, so there really is, it's not just about securing the grant funding to begin with and, and, um, and buying a piece of equipment or, or investing in an e-learning platform. I know that, that those that are looking at grant applications and considering funding really look closely at how sustainable is that program so that they know that investment is going to pay off, not just in the first year or so, but long term for the students and the districts and ultimately for whoever the stakeholders are for that grant. So, so Kelly, another question for you, um, as grant committees look for sustainability of a program, uh, what are the secrets to creating long term sustainability in your view? 
I think one of them is working with your post-secondary partners and your business partners to know um, what is the forecasted labor market of the pathway or the program that you're trying to implement and how, what do they need to best um, grow their, their talent pipeline. Uh, beyond that, including the staff. So giving them the professional learning on the equipment, on the labor market that they need to keep that program growing and to market the program. I also think it's really important that you budget for consumables, either through a course fee or a teaching learning item or a department fee, so that you're able to use that equipment long term. I think a great practice that I've seen others use as well as New Berlin in the region is to find out how to embed some of those Act 59 certifications right within those pathways. So then you have another way of bringing that Act 59 grant dollars back to grow the program that you're implementing with another grant. It's, it's really maximizing your grant dollars. Um, a way that we've been able to do that is through the, our MSSC certification um, that we were able to work with Mike through Lab Midwest on um, and we get that money back and we're able to put it right back, back into our manufacturing pathway. And one of the things we love about those certifications, certainly MSSC is a great one. The Smart Automation Certification Alliance is another one that we're, we're big advocates for, is, is the idea of creating a credential that is valued by an industrial employer. And, and in the end, certainly we have a lot of outcomes that we expect from grant funding and just creating a workforce for industry isn't the only outcome, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a significant one and it's an important one. And on that note, Jacob, I know you've had tremendous success in creating some great industrial partnerships. I, I was proud to be in this photograph with you and the senior leadership and ownership team from, from Metalcraft. And I know you've built a number of really solid industrial partnerships. So tell us a bit and tell our audience, what are the keys to making these partnerships successful? I have to go back to the same thing I said before. And the number one thing is honesty. Um, in this particular case, you see in the picture with this company, that was actually something Excuse the bells, sorry. I love the that bells, was, <laughs> that's great. That's education in action, thank you. It's my life, I almost got up. Um, <laughs> that's actually the one thing that, well not one thing, but that was one of the things that really helped with that company and working with me. And I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but they could feel that, they could sense that right away. There was honesty there. Um, and that's that's the big one that I've learned over the years. Uh, the second thing uh, is let them in, uh, bring them in obviously during COVID now, it's changed things quite a bit for me, but bring them into your facility, bring them in front of the, the kids they want to expose their company to the kids. They want them to see what they have to offer in most cases. Um, that's why they're there. They're trying to find future employees. And then uh, what I've done and tried to go out of my way of doing is, is give them students, um, uh, whether that's through youth, youth apprenticeships, um, job shadowing, uh, tours, get the students to them in front of them uh, their facility is is very important and i go out of my way to to find kids and and say what's your plan where do you plan on working do you have a plan and trying to get those kids to apply and, and directly work at that company um, that just creates that that give and take relationship that they want and sets up that pipeline if you will uh, keeping in touch can be hard. Uh, manufacturers are, if there are any listening, uh, you know, extremely busy. So um, I try not to be, I can be a little bit of a nag, uh, past at times, but try not to be too pestful, but just uh, uh, be persistent and, and be polite and not being afraid to ask uh, is another thing. Sometimes you can ask for too much. That's another problem. Uh, right from the get go asking, you know, Hey, I need a quarter of a million dollars. I just met you. That's, that's not really a good decision, but, um, but not being afraid to ask sometimes for small things, uh, for advice. Uh, that's a big one for help. It doesn't always have to be materials or money. Um, it can just be good help. And if they trust you and they build a relationship, maybe then they'll give you something that you can use in your program. Well, and such a great reference to words like honesty and trust and, and communication, um, not being afraid to ask, really, really important in terms of building great relationships with industrial employers. And you both have had tremendous success in doing that. Uh, in, in addition to making sure that we're bringing our industrial employers along with us in terms of our programs, you both referenced when we talked about both pitfalls and best practices, the importance of creating consensus and including uh, your business partners and your staff in the great grant writing process. So I want to pose this 
question to Kelly. And as much as you and Jacob both see that as a really, really important aspect of successful grant writing, how do you bring your staff and your business partners along in that process? Well, like I said before, I think you need to know where you want to go. Um, and often you need to get help, just like Jacob referenced, from your industry partners in your um, economic region to know where that is. So I think a best practice would to include them in curriculum development and alignment right at the table with your staff and your students. Um, our last grant that we wrote was for building out our manufacturing course, uh, How Machines Work, and you can see that here. Something we heard from our industrial partners was that you needed more automation and robotics within that pathway. So you can see here, here's a tabletop, tabletop mechatronics unit our students are explaining in the How Machines Work um, course. That would have not come to fruition if it wasn't for our staff and industry partners at the table as we were ideating around what we wanted this pathway to look like, and then we knew what we wanted to write the grant for. Great. So great collaboration among industrial employers, among your among your staff, making sure that we get them interested and excited, understanding the technology, involved in writing the curriculum is really, really important in terms of grant writing. Uh, now, Jacob, you've, you've been successful uh, in winning a number of grants, and uh, the, the work doesn't just end when you have the grant awarded. That's, that's right, isn't it? The, the key is managing the funding in an ongoing basis, uh, making sure that you're uh, keeping up with reporting and doing that appropriately. What tips would you share with our audience uh, for making sure that the data is collected post-grant and that the funds are put to their highest and best use? Sure. What I don't like is when people come to me and ask me where all the uh, reports are and all the data are and never told me to, to collect it. <laughs> um, so I can say to keep as an instructor, um, I like it when somebody's in charge of it. And, and the world of CTE coordinators is kind of going away, unfortunately, but having someone or one person or, or a small team that oversees it, our district has someone in our finance office that only processes purchases and manages funds for grants. That's a very handy thing um, to have. If, if, you don't, if you don't have that, just having one person that can be in charge and watching for rubrics, uh, FAQ sheets and things like that, collecting all that so you know where the dates are, setting calendar reminders, and, uh, and getting them done. Perfect. Thank you, Jacob. That's a, that's a great answer. And speaking of great answers to great questions, uh, Melissa, I know I'm just watching the clock, and we like to promise our viewers that we uh, stay right around that 30 minutes every single week so that we make amazing use of their time, uh, that they can get, uh, they get, get their learning in before the bell, as the case may be. Um, and so to that end, I'd like to invite you to, I, I've just seen a couple of great questions pop up from the audience during the discussion here today for both Jacob and Kelly. So if you don't mind uh, weighing in with what we're seeing, that would be great. Sure. Thanks, Matt. So the first uh, question that we had, I know um, we did have a couple of people ask about, you know, Matt had referenced earlier that our team has put together a list of some, just a few grant ideas that are available with statewide and, and uh, nationally. So um, if you are interested in that, just reach out to us uh, afterwards and we can, we can have that conversation later. Um, we had a question come in, uh, Kelly and Jacob, maybe you can both answer this one, um, but can you name some of the specific pieces of equipment or items that you used your grant money to purchase? Ladies first. Go ahead, Kelly. Sure. Uh, we purchased uh, a FANUC simulator, a FANUC uh, tabletop uh, robot. We purchased some lathes, CNC routers, the tabletop mechatronics that I cited before, our MSSC certification package we purchased through a grant, um, some of the CNA equipment um, that we had through a fast forward grant years ago. Um, we most recently purchased a Marge Forge Mach 2 3D printer and then a 3D scanner, um, soldering equipment, and an embroidery machine for a fat lab. Fantastic. Same question for Jacob. My list is not as long. I got to get going, <laughs> I guess. Um, we've uh, purchased a, a, a Haas um, CNC uh, machining center, Haas Mini Mill, um, a Marvel iron worker, um, a tabletop mechatronics unit, the same thing Kelly mentioned. Uh, we were just awarded a grant and will be purchasing another um, uh, LR Mate uh, uh, robotic cell um, from Lab Midwest. They hopefully know that already. Um, and uh, so that's the, the extent of our grants. Great, thanks. 
Um, just a reminder before we get to this next question, if you are in the audience and you do have a question, go ahead and pop that in the Q&A box there and we'll pose that to our uh, guests today. So the next question is um, with COVID, you know, we've seen some of the grant deadlines, um, funding deadlines being extended farther than when they normally would. How have you guys seen um, maybe the availability of grants affected by COVID or maybe their deadlines and how is that changing your strategies? It hasn't had much effect on me yet. So I don't know if Kelly has anything for that, but not for myself. No, I think just shifting more meetings um, and informational sessions with business partners and students and staff virtually, it's been the biggest impact. Um, as far as CTE equipment, we've been fortunate to have, you know, the MSSC certification is online. Um, so students can utilize those modules as intended. Um, the fan simulators have been great because you can use those with a computer. Um, we have partnered with WCTC often to go on site and use some of their large scale equipment with our students. Obviously we're not able to do that like we can yet. Um, so that's been a change. So thinking about what other virtual software and opportunities are out there might be something that we add to our grants uh, later on. Great, Kelly, I, you, you kind of touched on that, but um, the next question would be kind of, you know, what what are what solutions are you using to keep up with, uh, you know, the hands-on world of CTE during uh, uh, during COVID and our uncertain, you know, uh, times where we move from in-person to virtual back and forth and we don't know what's going to happen one day to the next. So, Jacob, what are you seeing on that front? Um we're doing our best. Uh, we're trying to utilize the, you know, there's, there are digital platforms out there. Um, there's some great stuff from Amatrol. We haven't purchased it yet because we're waiting to see if we are going, we're, we're full in person right now. So um, we're, we're doing our best to, to teach with what we have here and, and trying to, you know, space and clean and doing what we can. Um, so right now it's, everything's been pretty status quo. Uh, but if we were to shut down fully, um, that's going to be a different world yet uh, that we'll have to, to discover. But as Kelly mentioned before, a lot of things are, you know, you can run virtually using VPNs and that's very helpful. Um, and that's probably what we're going to have to do. And, and we've utilized our, our local tech school as well. So. Great. Well, I think that does it for audience questions. Matt, you want to wrap it up? Oh, I certainly do. And thank you, uh, Melissa, very much. I want to I begin, of course, by by thanking our guests. Uh, Kelly Kwiatkowski has just been fantastic, as has Jacob Gitter. Um, just just really good insights for uh, our educators as we head into what are going to be unquestionably uncertain times in terms of funding for education. So the more creativity, creativity, and the um, deeper we can look in terms of what where these opportunities are for grant funding. Uh, what different sources are available, and then how to make sure we're making best use of our time and building industrial relationships and in applying for grants and in tracking the information afterwards. So it's been a really, really good discussion. I want to thank you both for, so much for joining us. Welcome. Um, also want to thank uh, our producer, uh, Melissa Martin. Uh, Melissa, I don't know as we look uh, to the next couple of weeks of Webinar Wednesdays, if you know, but there's actually an election coming up. Um, that, uh, I had heard been... something about that. <laughs> um and so uh, surprising enough, uh, we have an election next week. We're going to have a little bit of fun uh, next Wednesday will be our election hangover edition. We are actually going to talk about the 10 things that our next president, whoever that individual may be, uh, should know about career technical education. So that will be our topic uh, for next week. We really look forward to having everybody join us then. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon on Webinar Wednesday.